Okay, so good afternoon and welcome to this Guide to Peer Review webinar. I'm David Gilmore, the founder of DG Legal. I'm really pleased that over 200 people have signed up to this webinar, and I very much hope that you take away some valuable tips over the next hour. I say hour, we may run a little over the hour, and I think the rules have changed a little bit um, in terms of being prompt when finishing. Because this is a webinar, I think it's acceptable to finish a few minutes late because people have the freedom, of course, uh, to end uh, the webinar and move on to their next appointment. Now, where we as a consultancy firm get involved in peer review, it is either because a firm wishes to improve its systems or it wants advice about appealing a peer review result. In many ways, it's understandable to wait until after you failed an audit to ask for help. However, prevention is the cheaper and better way of addressing any potential peer review problems. And in attending today's webinar, you've shown that you agree that prevention is better than cure. I'm very pleased to introduce today's presenters. It has been somewhat of a coup for us to have Professor Avram Sher, who is the founding father of the Legal Aid Peer Review System. Since 2002, peer review has been used as the system for assessment of the quality of publicly funded work in England and Wales, ensuring the quality of legal services received by the public, and he indeed leads the operation of this work. Tam Gill is the principal solicitor for Gledhill Gill Solicitors. She's a mental health solicitor with a particular focus on forensic mental health law and practice. Tam is ranked in the Chambers Directory as a BAM1 lawyer, and as well as representing clients, Tam also holds the position of Law Society Mental Health Panel Assessor. She is an independent costs assessor for the Legal Aid Agency, and she is a current mental health peer reviewer. Finally, Max Duddles is a consultant and head of department for Manda Cruikshank Solicitors and also assists us at DG Legal. Max established and runs Manda Cruikshank Solicitors Mental Health Law Department. He is a specialist in the process and procedures surrounding mental health and mental capacity legislation. Max is also regularly asked to deliver training to legal professionals as well as professionals in the health and social care sector. Please note that you will see some slides today and you'll also see some pictures of some of those in boxes. If you find that our pictures are in the way, you can move the boxes using your mouse or indeed minimize the boxes. A word about questions and answers. Please do use the Q&A box, which you'll see by wiggling your mouse at the bottom of the screen in order to raise questions. At the end of the presentation, I shall put some of the questions raised to the panel. I doubt we shall be able to answer all of them given the very high number of people present but all questions will be answered and we'll receive a copy of those and indeed they will be on our website together with the panel's answers. I can see that um, we already had a question about whether or not this qualifies for CPD points. Well, no and yes, no, because CPD was abolished in 2016 and was replaced by the competence regime, of course. Although confusingly, the term CPD is still used by the Legal Aid Agency in their SQM standard. The short answer is yes, you can, re you can record this in your training record. It will count no matter how or what system you follow. So I will hand over next to uh, Professor Avram Sher. So if you can take over Avram, please. Hi. David, and thank you so much for uh, inviting me and for giving me this um, enormous build-up. Uh, all I'd like to say is I'm, I'm, I'm not responsible for all the problems, only partly. Um, welcome, everybody. And um, what I'm going to try and do is explain a little bit about peer review and peer review from the beginning. Um, you'll recognize this sort of... Uh, uh, comment on your screen, press any key, um, and it's a little bit like playing the piano in that at one point you might have thought that any approach to quality would have been okay, and 
the Legal Aid Board and Legal Services Commission started off with a number of different approaches. Um, and one that you may recognize is transaction criteria, um, and that came in um, at about 1992. Franchising had already been there. I'm gonna to talk to you about input structure, process and outcomes. And we'd even tried something called peer review at the time um, because we had 12 people from the Law Society uh, all around a table looking at one file and guess we had 13 different opinions. Um, so we knew that it was a good idea but it needed a little bit more work. Um, we also had thought about model clients, that's sending um, unreal clients into lawyers to find out what happened. Um, and we were beginning to do things, but the Legal Aid Board, Legal Services Commission at that stage was only allowing uh, non-lawyers to make assessments of, um, of lawyers and lawyers' work. And so transaction criteria was the only way forward at that time. We were then allowed to move into um, a different approach and we did it through quality and cost, which was uh, really a very large randomized controlled trial. It's the gold standard for all research. And we had 142,000 cases, 82,000 of them completed, which we were able to look at and to consider for, um, for our work. Um, and the result um, was we could look at a number of different payment groups. Do you remember? My God, it's going back quite a way. Green form. Um, we looked at um, fix sum for work and fix number and sum, all sorts of approaches. And we also looked at the not for profit sector. And we did that in a number of ways briefcase, peer review, model clients, and client survey. Briefcase was basically looking at, at all of the statistics. But what we were basing ourselves on um, was this uh, model and approach to understanding um, the quality of professional work, uh, inputs, structure, process, outcomes. Uh, and uh, looking at these just very, very briefly now, I think you will know what sort of inputs are necessary for your firm good people, good library, um, good property, good IT, etc. But um, by itself, probably not terrific in terms of deciding whether you're a good firm or not, though it is among the things that are looked at under some of the management approaches. Well, you also needed structure in order to um, do good work and both uh, the inputs and the structure were what was uh, considered and still considered really in, in looking at the more formal, more accountancy type approaches to understanding how uh, law cases work and whether law firms are doing a good job. But next and much more difficult to measure is process and that's everything you actually do on the case, client handling, advocacy, strategy, decisions, advice, etc. Um, and that's more difficult to capture. Um, but it, if you think about it, brings together both the inputs and the structure. Um, another approach uh, uh, which has also been used to look at uh, the quality of work is, is outcomes, outputs. And these can be um, sentence, finance, private, action, inaction, public outputs, political, social damages, all sorts of things that one could measure. But the problem with measuring outcomes in relation to every legal case, which I'm sure every single person will agree, is that each case is different, each um, other side is different, each client is different, each judge is different, and what the judge uh, eats for lunch is different. So the only way really to measure all of this in one go, it seemed to us, was to actually look at the cases themselves and to measure the input structure, process and outcomes that we could see through looking at all of the case. 
And that we thought we would do with peers. In other words, people who work on the same cases as you in the same way. Um, and we got a whole set of those. We looked at 718 cases, first of all, over 55 contractees, this number of work areas. And the problems that we found were in selection of cases, selection of peer reviewers, training of peer reviewers, that criteria that we would give the peer reviewers to mark with, the samples chosen, and then subsequently monitoring. Um, our peer reviewers were a little bit like this um, New Yorker magazine cartoon, selective breeding has given me an aptitude for the law, um, but this one still loves fetching a dead duck out of freezing water. I, I don't have time to explain it if you um, have never looked at a, a New Yorker magazine, um, but it's fun. Um, what we found in the peer review was the problems of the reliability of the instrument with which they were marking the reviewers themselves. And we decided that instead of rating individual lawyers, which they've ended up doing on peer review in, in Scotland, we would look at the whole firm. And we concluded that we should double mark every case and only look at whole organizations, that's whole providers. And we realized and still realize now that all we're doing is actually getting an x-ray of um, what we're seeing. We're not, as it were, surgically opening everything and, and being at the firm when everything occurs or in the courthouse, we're getting an x-ray of it. But we learned quite a bit from peer review. We, we learned differences between solicitors and not-for-profit. We, we learned that three peer reviewers actually caused us lots of problems. One marked everyone highly, one marked everyone at lowly, and another one marked everyone at the middle. Um, we learned that there were differences between different subject matters and also between uh, different regions. Uh, strangely, especially Liverpool, which is where I was working at the time. But you can see, that we were getting somewhere in that there wasn't too much to hide beyond this point. We thought we'd send in model clients because everyone else was doing that. Um, and we thought we could find out certain things. We could only of course send in one visit and in a way we were breaking the law because we were using legal aid money for this particular purpose but were given permission to do so. And we learned specifically about the service aspects of um, the delivery of, of legal aid work, access, quality of advice, and immediate follow-up. And we, we looked at some particular um, areas uh, and we sent out these model clients, not quite robots, uh, in order to give us some results. And we found that there were lots of access difficulties with the not-for-profit group, which we thought had actually done well otherwise. Um, very difficult to get hold of them. But then we also could see through the eyes of these clients what the advice was that they were being given. And we could even look at that advice and we could consider through the eyes of peer reviewers whether it was good advice or not. And here we found inaccurate, impractical, woolly, confusing, contradictory, and inappropriate advice because of the way in which it was sent to clients or said to clients and how they actually took it in. On the other hand, we still needed lawyers around. Here was a model client. Advisor showed an impressive level of concern for my job security, understanding that I could not afford to lose my job. Overall, he was very helpful, reassuring and personal. But the peer reviewers looking at what the uh, lawyer had done and what the model client had thought said, although very clearly empathetic, this advisor does not really know enough about the law to be using legal aid money. A good example of touchy feely advice. So we learned that we actually had to think about what the clients were experiencing, which we'd got through the model clients. We needed to see what the lawyers were doing and how lawyers thought of how the other lawyers were doing. We needed to look at the outcomes. We needed to see the case profiles. Basically, we needed to find a way of bringing all of quality together in an interrelating fashion. And we wanted peer review to be 
both random and targeted. In other words, we didn't want uh, what was then Legal Services Commission and now the Legal Aid Agency to only look at firms they thought weren't good. We needed them to be random and targeted so that peer reviewers did not know what they were going to see. We needed and wanted a sensitive implementation. And we could compare with cost audits, with, uh, with TCs and compliance audits. We could see that peer review was better in terms of what a lawyer considered was quality for the sake of the client, even though that meant to an extent we were uh, drawing in the belt of the lawyers just a little bit more. Um, so here were the issues that we would noted and everything that we've done uh, since then is actually aiming to deal with these issues, selection of peer reviewers, and we've got what we consider to be a very good set of peer reviewers, training those peer reviewers, fashioning some criteria so peer reviewers couldn't simply put, put a, a thumb in the air and, and decide which way a whole set of cases should go, um, choosing the right sort of sample and then monitoring everything that was going to happen in peer review and peer review reports and making sure that always, and this I have to say has always been done, that there is a mixture of random selection and also targeted selection. This is the, the whole world then of peer review in operation. And these are some of the things that peer review has been used for. Some of you may recognize these. In general, it's used to look at all the work that you do. Uh, note that peer reviewers are also reviewed uh, by other peers <clears throat> before they can become peer reviewers and every two years. And they have to get at least a two every two years in order to remain as a peer reviewer. Um, briefly, very briefly, these are the gradings in uh, civil criteria. They're in the process paper. You can see them at the back. This is how everything is marked. And these are the, uh, the elements uh, of um, the criteria which the peer reviewers look at when they look through each of your files. Communication with the client. The advice given, the work that was carried out beyond that advice, if it was, if there was any more work, um, the appropriateness of, of uh, disbursements, etc., how effectively the organization uses resources. And here at number nine, did the advisor or their work in any way prejudice the client? That was a surprise that we were asked to put in by reviewers subsequently uh, because it was important. In family cases, we've got some extra questions. And then the overall mark for each of the files and beyond that, the overall mark for the firm. There is also in relation to the criteria, some specific guidance written for reviewers uh, by reviewers, uh, which enable them to uh, answer those criteria more specifically um, for each of the discipline areas. Um, I think that's enough for me from the moment, if that's okay, uh, David, and I'm going to hand over to others who are certainly better at using it, all the material, and, uh, and talking about it. Okay, thank you very much indeed, Adam. That was, that was really fascinating. I, I very much enjoyed and uh, listening to that and uh, invoking memories of many, many years ago. So thank you very much for that uh, overview. I'm going to turn now to Tam. And Tam is going to be speaking about what peer reviewers look for, amongst other things. Hello, hopefully you've all got the um, slides up. Now, the first thing I want to just emphasize is the level of training that peer reviewers have to go through in order to be appointed. Um, before we get to the training point, we have to submit an application form demonstrating that we have got a breadth of experience in the um, category of law that we wish to be peer reviewers in. If our application form passes muster, we are invited to an interview before a panel 
um, I had the dubious um, honour of being interviewed by Avram on being on my panel. And as part of the verbal interview, that you are then sent off into a room to undertake a file assessment to see, well, where's this peer reviewer's skill set at? If one passes all of that, you then go into a further process of um, training, which includes doing dummy peer reviews on files that have already been peer reviewed. So you're practicing on those, seeing if you can undertake the exercise fully, competently, properly. If you pass through that, you have your um, mentor appointed to you. I ought to have said that as part of the interview process, there is also a personal peer review, a PRPR. And if a peer reviewer gets less than a two, you're automatically thrown out of the process. It's more daunting than the X factor in many ways. Um, when, when you're appointed, you're appointed a peer reviewer, you're a probationary peer reviewer for a period of 12 to 18 months. And every single report that you compile is checked by the um, senior peer reviewer or one of the senior peer review team before it is sent out to a provider. We then undertake annual training. Unfortunately, this year, due to coronavirus, we haven't had a, an opportunity to meet face to face, but there's been written training guidance sent out. And even now, reports are still either randomly or selectively um, assessed before they are sent out to providers. So I want to reassure everybody at the outset that there is a huge amount of um, training and consistency training that is imparted to all peer reviewers. What are we looking for as peer reviewers? And the starting point really is the peer review guidance. The, we, we call it the peer review guidance. Its full name is Improving Your Quality Mental Health. And we are tasked with identifying how a provider can improve their quality. How can you and how do you provide the best service for your clients? And this is, I cannot emphasize this enough. I'm going to sound like a very stuck record. How are you evidencing this on your files? As a starting point, we utilize the contents page of the peer review guidance, which sets out 17 um, topics. And I will just start reading them to you and then you'll all get bored and stop listening. Are files organized and legible? Were the advisors selected to be involved in the matter appropriate? Number three, was the initial contact with the client timely? Are clients who are detained in hospital visited sufficiently regularly to obtain instructions in form of progress? Has the client been advised of the merits in their case? The list goes on. That is what we are looking for evidence of as a starting point when we're undertaking your peer review. So why do we do this? All peer reviewers are practitioners. I am a mental health solicitor. You are mental health lawyers. We want to, as practitioners, we want to make sure that at every stage, we're doing the absolute best for our client. We're giving the best quality advice to each client. We're carrying out our client's instructions. We want to make sure that every legal issue that comes up in a case is addressed and the client is able to understand the advice we're giving them. We want to achieve the best outcome for each client as per their instructions, as per their circumstances, and have the client having considered understandable advice, comprehensible advice. As a peer reviewer, we're doing exactly the same thing. The list is there. We want to ensure that you're giving the best quality advice to your client, you're carrying out their instructions, all the legal issues relevant to the retainer are addressed. You're achieving the best possible outcome for your client. Evidence, evidence it. If we can't see the evidence that it has been done, we cannot assume, guess, crystal ball gaze into whether or not you did it. I appreciate fully that we're so busy. We know that as busy practitioners, we'll run through a quick rattle of a checklist through our head. Have I asked about the nearest relative? Have I asked about an independent? Have I done X, Y, and Z? But the fact is, unless you note that down on your file, as a peer reviewer looking at your file, unfortunately, I can't read your mind. It may be that that's what you always do and you're so used to doing it that you omit to note it down. But look at every file as if, 
the quick pickup test. Could somebody walk in and understand everything I have done on this file and pick it up and run with it? We look at the first 12 files of the 15 that you're asked to submit for peer review. We don't get a choice. We have to work down the order in which they are requested of you. We look at each file individually and then take the sample as a whole and we apply the criteria that Avram just referred to. We exercise judgment and it's not sitting in judgment of you, our own judgment. We're experienced, we've been around uh, more years than I care to admit to. And we appreciate that not one size fits all cases. One formulaic approach will not be the right approach for every case. You have to do things differently as per client, as per situation. You know, it's very obvious that during the coronavirus pandemic, things have significantly changed. So how are you still imparting quality advice to your clients in each set of circumstances as per your client's instructions and what's going on at the time? Having reviewed all your files and made copious notes, assessed each file against the criteria, looked at the whole sample, we then have to rate each file. And as peer reviewers, we'll go through your pile of files one by one, rate it, and then go back and look at the whole sample. We're then tasked with writing a report, which I've said to Avram in private, and I'll say it out loud, it is a horrible experience writing a report because it's so very detailed. We have to get it absolutely right. We must give examples of your good practice. If we're finding a positive, we give examples of this is great, this provider is evidencing consideration of independent reports, C file A, B, F and G, is um, tailoring the advice specifically to clients. For example, C file A, CAMS patient, C file um, F, um, elderly patient with dementia. We point to the positive examples. When we make a criticism, we have to point to where we've seen it. As Avram said, we don't just stick a thumb in the air and say, well, we don't like this file sample at all. We think you're terrible. We have to give examples of what has concerned us and why it has concerned us. So you will see that within the report. We use subheadings in the report, and that is to help us structure the report, but also to help the provider understand where our opinion and where our findings have their genesis. And the typical um, subheadings in the peer review report are positive findings, and I would like to think that there are quite a few positive findings um, in any given sample major areas of concern, and these are where the client's been put at a detriment, a real detriment. For example, missing hearings, not giving advice on eligibility periods, and so the client is missing the opportunity to submit an application. Um, serious faults that are noted, any major omissions that are going on, and they may be a major fault on one file. You may have only missed one hearing, but it will go as a major fault. However, or equally, you may never evidence that you ask the um, client detained under part two as to whether you are able to contact the nearest relative as the nearest relative has a right, has a power to seek discharge. And so that would then qualify, in my opinion, as a major fault. Other areas of concern are those that are not so severe as to be major areas of concern, howling bloopers but the work really could be done to a higher standard. The areas for development, the, the hint is there, We're, we, we have areas that we see that you, you're, the provider is not necessarily undertaking work to the highest level, they may just touch upon it, but not progress it. Um, that you may always obtain section papers, but thereafter never really do anything more other than note the date. You're not looking at the reasons for detention the risks that are relied upon, is it own health, own safety, protection of others, one, two, three, or a combination of. Further comments, um, although I, anecdotally I hear this is the one that makes um, providers roll their eyes, that, oh my goodness, why is a peer reviewer picking me up for that? 
But these are sort of what I call little niggles. You may still be referring to the RMO or the ASW or the Legal Services Commission. Um, they're minor issues that don't affect the quality of your work. However, are matters that have been noted and we're asking you just to take note and do something about them, please and thank you. The suggested areas for improvement is where we have to sit down, go back over the, what we've written previously and give you guidance on and suggestions as to how you could improve the work you are doing to move up from whatever rating we've given you. Anecdotally, I had the most reassuring thing once. I had a um, colleague practitioner come up to me and say, Tam, you're a peer reviewer. And I thought, oh goodness, do I admit to this? Uh, yes, I am. Well, I want to tell you something. And my anxiety levels increased. I got a four in my peer review. And I thought, oh dear, here we go. And he said to me, it's the best thing that ever happened to me. Right, do go on. He was given a second peer review six months later. And he told me that his second peer review, he was given a one excellence. And he went on to explain that he looked at the peer review report that gave him the four, accepted and truly did accept that he'd fallen into just doing things, tick boxing along and not really progressing things. He'd fallen into bad habits. The report made him sit up, look up, pay attention and pull his socks up. He got a one and to me that encapsulates what I think peer review is all about. It's about improving quality. It's not about making people feel terrible. It really isn't. <clears throat> so the ratings, um, Avron's referred to them and over the next few slides, we set out what is given to us in the process paper as peer reviewers, it's available, as to what comprises excellence, competence, threshold competence, below competence and failings when we are assessing each file and the provider's sample as a whole. And you can see they're fairly comprehensive and you know, a rating of one is truly excellent. It is very difficult to achieve across the board because we live in the real world. We appreciate that there is this tension between wanting to do the very, very best on every single file and the fact that events do oftentimes overcome us. You know, if you've got a section two client, you pick them up, you sign them up, you apply for medical records, but by the time the next day rolls around, the RC is taken off section. Well, the truth is, how can you demonstrate full excellence on that file? Because it's been taken away from you. But there is the rating for excellence. Competence plus, again, very, very good. And it's doing things to a high standard. You're thinking laterally, strategically. You're picking the case up. You're running with it. And you're adding a true value to the client's case and bringing about um, a result with your proactive approach. Threshold competence, as a peer reviewer, I will say, is one of the most tricksy and tricky categories within the five because it's such a broad band to be in. You can just about scrape into threshold competence or you can be right at the top of it, just below a level two. It's a very broad um, band to be in. But again, you can see from here, it's adequate work. You're doing the job, you're ticking your way through, but there are some areas that you could really work on as a provider to raise your work from a three to a two or even a one. Below competence, information's not being reported, or, sorry, recorded or reported accurately on the file. The communication is not particularly of the best standard that it could be because of poor quality. It may be inadequate in terms of detail. It may be legally incorrect or incomplete. There is a lack of diligence and care being engaged into the work you're doing. The timeliness of your communication is not as good as it could be. And the work is inadequate. There are lapses in your sample below the required standard. And 
a failure in competence. Again, these are rare in my experience. To, I, in my experience, I've not done a peer review and given it a five. There is, mostly there is some redeeming feature in a, in a um, sample. But we are talking about a detrimental service to clients. If you like, the provider is actually causing damage by getting involved. There is no meaningful science and service, and there is a potential or real prejudice to the client by what has or has not been done on these files in this sample. Moving on to examples of good and poor practice, a question I get asked quite often. And I, I really did think hard about what can I give as an example of good and poor practice? And again, these are just my opinions, but I think that they're fairly uncontroversial. Carrying out your client's instructions fully. Giving full legal advice and preferably accurate legal advice on all the issues and all the matters that are relevant to the case. Where you identify a matter that is outside of the scope of our mental health contract, being able to spot it and refer the client on to another provider. Giving evidence of what you have done and an explanation of why something hasn't been done. For example, nearest relative contact, not undertaken, client does not give authority to so do. And we want it to be done at the right time, at the material time. When you're taking initial instructions or quite early doors, you may want to say to the client, well, look, your instructions are to get me out of here, or get you out of here. Yes, you can apply to the tribunal. Yes, you can apply to the hospital manager. Yes, the RC can potentially discharge you, but also the nearest relative does have this power to, et cetera, et cetera. So it's giving the advice at the right time. There's very little point giving that advice later, late in the day. Being proactive, driving the case, picking it up and running with it. And thinking about your client as an individual. Each client is different, their circumstances are different, their needs, their instructions, the way we deal with them, they are all different. Good practice of corresponding with third parties. Uh, for example, the RC, the social worker, nearest relative, in restricted cases, the Ministry of Justice, if there are um, coexisting family, housing, criminal, et cetera, proceedings, maybe asking your client's permission to liaise with the other lawyer so that you can formulate your advice and assist the client more holistically. Full preparation, again, section papers is one of my favorite little hobby horses, meaningful examination of them. Um, CPA meetings where there is a sufficient benefit for attending those. Some of us have clients that we've represented previously, maybe once, twice, maybe for 10 years or so, bringing forward relevant papers to be able to give um, the current file all the information that you can quickly and easily obtain and review. Looking at medical notes, and I put there in brackets, meaningfully reviewed, having 42 pages of handwritten notes about um, diet and fluid taken well, woke up on time, etc. Unless that is meaningful to the particular case, it's not really going to progress and drive this case. Full legal advice, and in our heads we may well, as we all do, think, well, yes, your eligibility period is 6, 6, 12, and these are your dates, and yes, you're entitled to 117, or no, you're not entitled to 117. Yes, the tribunal can discharge you or make recommendations but make the advice I would suggest full, accurate, appropriate. If you've got a patient on a section two, you're not going to be bothering them too much about um, the powers of the tribunal to put them on a community treatment order, because there isn't one. If you've got a um, 3741 patient, you may not want to perhaps explore nearest relative powers because there are none, but make it relevant to your client's circumstances. Um, Another example is where the client's not seeking discharge, merely a recommendation, specifying statutory um, recommendations for part two and extra statutory recommendations and for part three cases. And again, there is my favorite phrase, evidence the work done. It should be the case that any mental health practitioner could walk into your, your firm, 
pick up the file and just run with it without having to try and backfill and understand what's been going on in the background. Poor practice. And again, it's just a mirror image of the previous slide. And I hope that's not controversial. And I think I'm done, so I shall hand over to Max Duddles. Thank you very much for that, Tam. Let me just share my screen with everyone. Um, should be coming up a minute. So yes, um, David asked me to come on board to talk about the importance of using high quality template attendance notes and letters. And before I get started into that, I'm hoping that really two things uh, are shining out from what Tapham and Tam have both had to say. The first is, there is very little point when you get that letter or that email saying, right, you've got a peer review, please have these 15 files ready for two weeks time to suddenly get all those files out and go, oh my goodness, how am I going to make these right? Because that's not how peer review is designed. In fact, it's designed to try and prevent you from doing exactly that sort of thing. Uh, and the second point, uh, I think, uh, is one that Tam's made very ably. There is no magic pro forma, there is no magic letter, there's no magic anything that you can use on each and every file in order to get at least level three peer review. The advice you give has to be individualized and also frankly has to be given at the right time. So as David said at the beginning, I do a lot of training uh, to uh, mental health professionals, uh, social work professionals, uh, and there's a mantra um, when we, uh, we talk to them and that is, if it isn't written down, it didn't happen. And that's a mantra I'd like you to take on board, although I'd like to add it at the word legibly. If it isn't written down legibly, it didn't happen. Where is your evidence, that evidence that Tam was talking about? So if you approach your files after this, literally after this, go and pick up a file, approach your files in exactly the same way that you would consider medical records or reports, looking for the evidence of all the things that are written down in the peer review guide and see what you are able to do and what you aren't able to do, what needs to be changed, what, what you're doing well. Because everything that is on those files is a fact or evidence of some sort of discussion which shows or hopefully shows that you are doing things properly if you are giving the advice properly and, and taking on board what other people are saying. And quite frankly as well, um, when sometimes people ask me, they say, oh, well, what, what if I put an explanatory note to the peer reviewer? Oh, kind of helps, maybe, it depends what you're talking about, but really uh, contemporaneous notes are the best notes. So you want to be making a full record of what you did on the day uh, literally on the day. Um, we have in my firm, for example, uh, not only do we have the dates of telephone notes, but we also have the times of telephone calls, uh, just to demonstrate that we are actually, uh, you know, recording things as they happen. Um, and this is my, uh, I think we all have a little bet noirs. Uh, this is my bet noir, um, the, the bespoke or pro forma question. Uh, and quite frankly, pro forma, one size does not fit all. Some pro forms are absolutely fine if you're giving standard advice to particular types of clients, like for example, you've got section two clients, you need to tell them about tribunals, you need to tell them about hospital managers meetings, but you might want to have a fact sheet that does all of that. Um, but your letters need to be tailored to that particular client's needs. You need to be writing down what that client actually told you, the advice that you gave that client, and not as sometimes we see, four pages of, uh, I talked to you about a uh, hospital manager's meeting, and this is what I say, and that's repeated again and again and again on each file. Number one, that looks incredibly suspect. And number two, for example, as I've seen recently, if you're giving advice to somebody who has an LD, which is four pages, apparently, when you were sat talking to them, when you're then reading a report later on, which says this person has uh, problems with concentrating, it does rather suggest that's not actually what you did. So your advice needs to be tailored. And of course, you can make a note of the advice you were unable to give, but you would have liked to, but you were unable to do it because um, the client just, you know, had run out of concentration or whatever it was. 
And an additional thing to think about as well is the timing of your advice. Um, we see a lot of uh, letters at the beginning, usually the, the, the original client care letters. We've talked about instructing an independent expert. We've decided not to. Right, words to that effect. Really? You're giving that advice at the beginning because the time at which you should be thinking about that is really when you've got the reports and you've taken your client's instructions off them. That's when you should be thinking about it very carefully because you're wondering what bits of the reports the client's agreeing with and what bits the client is disagreeing with. So you need to time the advice correctly. And, and that's also probably true about the merits of the case. Not really much point talking about the merits of the case at the beginning. Um, you need to be advising the clients of the merits of the case all the way through as well. Common pitfalls uh, that we've seen are, uh, for example, a failure to record when or how contact was initially made. You don't get that initial dated telephone call. How is the peer reviewer going to know whether you went to see that client within two days or within five days, depending on what's required? Um, merits of the case advice, as I've just touched upon, being given in initial client care letters, but then nothing being picked up afterwards. Um, you know, when, you, when you, you're looking at the reports, that really is the time to get into talking to the client about the merits of their case and probably face to face followed up by a letter as well. And this last bit, last uh, bullet point is the big one for me getting the law wrong and you're usually getting the law wrong because the pro forma gets the law wrong uh tam touched on this as well if for example you've got uh let's say a section 3741 standard letter or standard fact sheet which is going out to a client and telling them about their right their nearest well, well the rights of their nearest relative and talking about the possibility of section 23 uh discharge by your nearest relative well you're getting the law wrong aren't you because those types of um, patients do not have nearest relatives. So making sure that what you are telling the client in a pro forma uh, is right, and also making sure that you are sending the right pro forma to the client uh, in each and every case, because if you're sending a section two pro forma to a section three client, then you're giving a whole load of completely incorrect advice, which of course the, uh, sorry, which of course the peer reviewer is going to pick up on. Um, so quality, not quantity is the key here. Tailoring the advice, taking out all that extraneous material the client doesn't need to know about and, and really uh, addressing whatever their individual circumstances are. Uh, considering whether or not to uh, take uh, um, witness statements and uh, perhaps instruct experts to come needs to be very thoroughly done. How many clients do you get who say, well, if you just go and ask my cousin, brother, whatever, he'll tell you that all of this was right. You've got to go off and do it. For me, you've got to go off and do it as an instruction of the client. It might be that particular relative or that particular friend said something different, but again, it might be that they say something which absolutely supports your client's case. And then finally, um, requests for notes, various types of notes not being made or chased. Uh, that also is, is a key error. Uh, when you're looking, for example, at a report that says, um, client did not make contact with the community mental health team um, and the client's swearing blind that they did, well, you should be going off and asking for the community mental health team's notes and chasing them up if they're not provided. So all of those things are very, very common pitfalls for me. Um, in terms of uh, just tips and useful guidance that I can give to everyone, I think uh, if you're not using a workflow uh, for each and every individual section um, within your firm, then that's something really ought to be considering. You should certainly be encouraging staff to think for themselves and not just follow some kind of pro forma by road thing that everybody does, therefore they must do it. My apologies, I think I now have an aircraft flying over where I am. Um, and uh, encouraging them to use their, their skills. Um, need to do this. Uh, therefore, we should be allowed to uh, get on with it uh, and, and uh, use their skills appropriately. I'm also encouraging people who are writing letters, people who are writing um, uh, preparation notes and attendance notes to actually think about the content of those notes and not follow, again, some kind of cut and paste routine. Uh, is incredibly useful. And above all, if you are in senior management positions within your firm, uh, ensure that you are supervising properly uh, and that you are actually going around to your individual peers and making sure that they are okay. And if you are uh, in a slightly more junior position, you're being supervised, then make sure that you are being supervised and not being left to your own devices and that you are 
receiving the help and support that you need. Okay, that's that's all I've got to say. Uh, so uh, thank you for watching. But I think David would like to know if you have any questions. So uh, thank you very much, everyone. Yes, thank you, Max. Uh, that was uh, incredibly uh, useful. And thank you also to Tam and Avram. Uh, I'm sorry that there was some uh, some sound quality issues in that last segment. I guess that's down to the varying quality of, of the internet. Now, we, we haven't had many substantive questions. I have got a couple of substantive questions which I can put to the panel and perhaps I should, as I've mentioned in the, in the uh, Q&A, uh, I've been pulled up on the fact that cost lawyers still do use uh, CPD, so I'm sorry for that omission. So um, I guess it's really down to the Association of Cost Lawyers um, whether or not a training provider has to register with them. So if the answer is yes, then no, that wouldn't qualify for CPD for cost lawyers. But if it's not necessary to register, I guess the answer is almost certainly yes. But let's go on to a couple of substantive questions. So the, the most common question I've had with peer review appeals is this. So a firm gets a four. Um, a firm puts representations in and the answer that comes back is not a direct answer to the points made in the appeal, but instead is a copy of an amended peer review report. And I think the firms that have, uh, have um, experienced that just wonder why is it that they're direct representations aren't directly addressed. Is it because it's not feasible to do so? I wondered if any of you could answer that question. Shall I have a go at that? Yes, please. Yes. So representations were not intended to be an appeal. Um, that's really the first point. Representations were intended uh, to give an opportunity for the provider to say, this is totally wrong. And if you had looked at uh, the letter of the 15th of November, you would have noticed and then setting out uh, information of that sort. Um, mainly, however, um, we um, get other sorts of representations um, and uh, some of them are not really relevant to the point that was being made. At some, um, at some juncture in the past, we decided it's not a good idea to set up an argument between uh, the reviewers uh, and uh, the firm reviewed, but simply to make a decision on the representations. If they um, are, one, accurate and too relevant, then that may well bring a four up to a three. Um, if it's felt that they don't actually answer the issue that was being raised, then it may well stay as a four. But arguing over each of the issues, some of which may not have been considered relevant by the peer reviewers, didn't seem to be a very helpful way to move forward. And so what they do is they um, review the report and they then write it uh, where they're accepting information or the representations um, by taking out the uh, initial issue or amending what it's saying um, and stating clearly that they have had the opportunity to look at all representations but have not decided that all of them were relevant to the points that they were making. Um, it, it isn't as satisfying as having the opportunity to have a full um, and open discussion over a telephone or anything like that. Uh, and I think we realize that. And hopefully the reports do enough to explain what it is that's wrong. Accepting criticism is, <laughs> is very, very difficult. And, and I would be the first to say that I'm pretty bad at accepting criticism. Um, many lawyers in 
firms that have been going for a long time may not have ever been criticized in work, although they might have been criticized at home, for many, many years. And, and it's, it's jolly difficult to look at things rather like the, the person that Tam was talking about, uh, to look at what somebody else has said about your work and then think, oh, um, <laughs> maybe they were right. Um, what I would do if I'd got a four is I'd set it aside for a day and I'd then pick it up the next day and start thinking about it just a little bit more. Because although it may not be right, it might be. Um, and the people who make these decisions are your peers. They really, they really know how you feel and how your work goes. I think I've said enough, David. Yeah, I think that's a, a very good answer. And I'd just like to complement that by adding that in our experience, where a practitioner is very upset with a four or a five, and they consider themselves to be very experienced, what often happens is that, um, they go off on what you might think is a rant and get very, very critical about what the peer reviewer has stated and the peer reviewer's findings rather than actually addressing which points can be uh, appropriately challenged. So in other words, the throwing the mud at the wall approach very rarely works. You have to be quite selective about the points you're going to challenge and ensure that those points do have merit. Okay, a couple of other questions. Uh, please, will you send the slides to this peer review session? Yes, of course, we will send you the slides and also a link to this recording. Another question, this is quite a good question. Why does peer review not look at actual performance in, for example, the tribunals? And on what the questioner means is not in terms of performance in terms of the results, but in terms of the, the lawyer's examination skills, covering the points, adapting to the information on the hoof and such. Um, so it's, it's a little bit like peer reviewing advocacy, isn't it? Do you have any comments on that? Um, God, if this is me again, sorry, Tam, I'll, get, <laughs> let, I'll let you come in. Uh, we wanted to, um, in many ways, um, sit in on client interviews, um, listen to uh, negotiations with the other side, um, go along to tribunals, etc. Of course, we would have loved to. Um, I started my own, um, my own PhD work on actual client interviews, uh, which we were fortunate enough to, um, to videotape and, and looked at them and analyzed them. The trouble is, it's almost impossible to spend that amount of time in doing um, the work that would be necessary. And in relation in particular to tribunals uh, and to any court case, we found that they never really occur at the time that is expected, um, that they may not occur on the date that's expected, that they might be put off again and again. It just basically isn't financially possible to do the work of, of what would really be sitting with the lawyer all of their time. One, one couldn't do it. And is that still valid if it's a video hearing? Um, I don't know that we could actually spend the time to look through a whole video hearing, but what's important in relation to the video hearing, which is a good question, David, is what's done afterwards as a result. So from the file, we should be able to work out what the preparation was for the video hearing, what was said at the video hearing, and what the result is and how they've moved onwards from that. So I'd, I'd love to do all of those things. There's no way in which the LAA is gonna pay for that to happen, unfortunately. There is nowhere in the world that any form of quality assessment like that occurs. There's a few places where they actually use judges or the tribunal chairs to make decisions. But if you think about it, there are real issues in relation to that. Because if you take on the judge or take on the tribunal chair, they may not love you for it. Um, but even then, that's not an, a whole element of, of the quality assessed. You must be psychic because you've actually answered the next question about why 
interview with Furness is not included, so you've answered that, that's great. Um, you may have other questions. We're coming towards the end of this webinar now, and if anyone can think of any other questions they'd like to raise, please do, if possible, send those questions to us by noon tomorrow, and then we'll work on um, answering those questions as, as soon as we're able to do so. If you've enjoyed this webinar, please do consider leaving a Google review or a Facebook recommendation. Uh, that would be enormously appreciated by us and the speakers. And we'll reciprocate by sending you a mental health fire review form, which is based on the findings of mental health peer reviewers as laid out in the peer reviewers guide to common issues. And we'll also alert you when the new peer review process document has been published and provide you either with a copy or with a link. So it just, it just um, remains for me to say thank you so much, um, Avram, Max and Tam, and also to my colleague Alison Fisher, who's been on standby in case of any awful technical problems, but apart from a few sound crackles, we've been, we've been okay. So thank you very much, and uh, I wish you a good afternoon. Goodbye. <laughs>